I'm Olga Mayorova, the dir director of Greece, and first I want to say a few words about our upcoming events. Um, on March 23rd and 24th, we have 20th annual symposium, symposium of Soyuz, uh, the research network of post-socialist cultural studies. It will be uh, centered, focused, uh, the focus will be not only Reese area, but also China, and I think it's even more it's even more inviting and I and appealing such a combination. Uh, so it would be a very interesting conference. Uh, I just saw the the program, and the program is on uh, on Cree's website. So please look at it if uh, you are interested in post socialist cultural studies, which is a fascinating thing to do, uh, uh, to study. And our next noon lecture will be uh, on April the 4th, um, Edward, Edward Paxson, um, who is a RIS MA and uh, mm, Law School alumnus, is now Principal Counsel of the International fin Finance Corporation of the World Bank. Uh, he will present a lecture called Beyond the Tower, what happens when your grad school application essay comes true. Um, <laughs> so uh, we will have lots of, uh, uh, lots of fun, I think, to find out <laughs> about that. Um, uh, so, and I'm delighted to introduce our today's speaker, today's speaker, uh, Mila Turajlic, uh, documentary film director. Miller was born in Belgrade, Belgrade Serbia. Uh, she graduated from the London School of Economics with, the de with two degrees, film and TV uh, production and media and communications. Um, initially, Miller was involved in political activism, but then uh, converted herself into um, into filmmaking into art in the belief that art is more subversive than political activism mm -hmm. um, so and that's um, and the result of this conversion was very successful the movie uh, cinema communist the, fi the film uh, the documentary film that actually many of us watched yesterday and today we will get a deeper insight in how it was made and mm, what was what surrounded the entire uh, and inspired the entire project. So please join me in welcoming Mila. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, just to clarify, because it is a very confusing biography. Uh, I was uh, very politically active in my youth in Serbia in the 90s, and uh, I was the first generation that graduated from George Soros's debating program, which was set up in the whole of Eastern Europe. So I'm um, very kind of inspired by politics, and I actually did a degree, my degree at the London School of Economics was in politics and international relations. And at the same time, I did a degree in film and television production from the film school in Belgrade. So there was a whole d real split in my mind about where I wanted to go. And then definitely with the revolution in 2000, I became a very disillusioned <laughs> revolutionary and uh, just found that I believe in, in artistic communication much more than I believe in political communication. And uh, hopefully some of that comes through in Cinema Comunista. But uh, first, I have to apologize for having lost my voice. Um, so you're going to have to suffer through my croaking. But um, hopefully you'll have as many questions as I'll have answers. So at least we'll be having a dialogue. Uh, and um, one other thing is I, I don't know how many people saw the film. Um, hope so it was a kind of a challenge to structure this. I don't know if I'm talking to people who have seen it or who haven't. But uh, if there's anything not clear, just let me know and, and we can spend some time on that. Um, we came up with this title, Reconstructing Yugoslav Identity on Film, because that was really what I was trying to investigate when I was making Cinema Comunista. And I'll share with you one thing I found in my research that really kind of sparked my interest for this subject. So I was digging through the library of the um, Yugoslav Cinematheque, which is basically this old apartment, um, kind of stacked to the ceiling with books, and there were these... Um, they were called the Red Bulletins for Cinematography, and I found an ad in one of them, which really was bizarre. Um, 
and oh, sorry about that. Going, this is the ad. I translated a part of it for you. Public call for synopsis and scripts for a feature film about the role of railway workers in the National War of Liberation, which is to say the Second World War. The film needs to show the unity of railway workers of all of our nationalities in the organized struggle led by the Yugoslav Communist Party and Comrade Tito against fascist occupiers and domestic traders. What's most bizarre is that this ad is from 1976. Um, and uh, I uh, remember the image you see on the back of the screen, because I'm sure you want to know whether this film was ever made. But uh, this is what the original ad looked like. If you see the photo in the ad and the photo in the background, you'll realize that the film was indeed made. And it is actually <laughs> quite an accurate um, replica of what I think the people who wrote the ad were, were intending. You can see there were um, cash prizes for the best script. And uh, to me, this kind of encapsulated the fact that the Yugoslav state was incredibly active in constructing a cinema that would tell the story it wanted told. So in a way, I think you, we could go as far as to say that there was a definite construction of a Yugoslav identity or Yugoslav narrative using cinema. And I just found that fascinating because, to be honest, I'm not a film historian. In making this film, I didn't, I didn't approach this subject as a film historian. I was more a scholar of political science interested in the use of political narrative and so on. So um, to take us back uh, 30 years to the beginning, this is kind of the mission statement for Yugoslav cinema as defined by the man who was given the task of creating a Yugoslav cinema right after the Second World War. So basically, um, for those of you who haven't seen the film, just a little historical background. Uh, Yugoslavia, as it emerged from the Second World War, was led by Tito. Already in Tito's military headquarters during the war, they created a film section. So you get an idea that this was a man who, who knew immediately what he was going to do with cinema. My personal interpretation for this is the fact that Tito was in Russia during the Bolshevik Revolution. And uh, I personally think, I, I've looked at some of the biographies dealing with his early life, uh, there isn't that much mention of it, but I personally think he must have seen what Lenin was doing with cinema. So he must have had, a, you know, that, that kind of added to his understanding of what cinema could do. So anyway, Alexander Vucho, a very, very famous uh, writer and poet uh, of Yugoslavia, kind of came up with this, um, you know, mission statement of what our film art is supposed to do and what it's supposed to show. And um, the result of it is, is quite an interesting paradox. I found this quote from a very famous Yugoslav film historian. I absolutely love it because I think it encapsulates the bizarreness of what took place in Yugoslav cinema. So it is this paradox that it's a small nation with a huge history, uh, creating what is essentially a very small cinema industry with these absolutely huge ambitions. And by the 1960s, they were making films in Yugoslavia which were the most expensive films made in Europe at the time. So it gives you an idea of the megalomania kind of driving this, this cinema project. The still you see here is uh, a shot of the film studios in Belgrade, of the central film studios, and they were really the depart point of departure for me making this film. So for those of you who haven't seen the film, let me introduce this to you. Um, Avala Film was originally called the Central Film Studio. It exists still today in Belgrade on a, hill, on a hill above Belgrade, but very much in the city center. It was created in 1947, founded by Tito. There is even this document, which you can see in the film, which Tito personally signed. 49% of all feature films made in Yugoslavia were shot in this studio. So even though there were other important studios in the various republics, particularly in Croatia, but also in Slovenia and in Bosnia, even one in Macedonia, uh, Mm, almost half of the films made in Yugoslavia were produced by this uh, one film studio. The studio's status is uh, that it's socially owned, which is a category that doesn't exist in the new Serbian constitution anymore, so it's kind of in limbo, in li uh, legal limbo, which uh, means it has to be privatized, it has to be sold. Initially, there was an idea that it would be um, sold to, uh, that it would be sold by tender, so um, obliging the buyer to guarantee he would preserve it as a film studio for at least three years. There was one interested party, which was oddly enough from Los Angeles. Um, things didn't work out. This happened about three, four years ago. Things didn't work out politically for this uh, American buyer to buy the studios. Then uh, two years ago, our president went, mm, went to New York and met with Robert De Niro. 
offering him the studios to buy and got a very kind of non-committal, oh yeah, sounds very interesting from De Niro. Uh, it's not by accident that he chose De Niro. De Niro actually came and was in Yugoslavia in, in the early 70s, so there was a connection and his daughter is even named after a famous river in, in Yugoslavia. So there they, they thought he would be the interesting Drina. So they thought he, he would be kind of a natural, a natural buyer for the studios. So anyway, just... Um, to give you background, uh, what you see at the top is a model. I found uh, this archive in the Yugoslav Cinematheque. This is the original design for the studios. And if you saw the film, uh, you'd know that less than a third of this was ever, ever constructed. So again, you know, very much an indication of the megalomania that, that was behind this whole project. This is what the studios look like today. Uh, some of the sets still remain very run down. Um, some of the studios were still being used to... Um, to our uh, eternal shame to make this really terrible but most watched um, evening, kind of Saturday night entertainment program on, on pink television. Pink television already tells you something about you know what this, what this entertainment program is like. But anyway, it's not used anymore. Um, this is the state of its props department. This is the state of its film lab, which doesn't have any electricity, even though the machines are in working order. So um, that's just the sad, sad um, reality of the studios today. But um, to take you one step further, the inspiration for these studios obviously came from the Italian Cinecittà. It was this whole idea that they could transport that model of creating films there. The Cinecittà, after the Second World War, was thriving because American films were being shot. There was a whole interest in shooting American films in Yugoslavia as well, particularly after the split with Stalin. And if you saw the film yesterday, you'll see how um, dramatic that was in, in reorienting U Yugoslavia's policy um, towards cinema. So just to tell you a little bit about this Hollywood connection, in 1948, right before the split with Stalin, of the 122 imported films in Yugoslavia, 97 were Soviet and only one was American. By 1952, there was no Soviet films shown in Yugoslav cinema, so it shows you this radical shift of, of policy. What's interesting is that by 1961, they, they, they regained a balance between showing, Yugoslav, uh, between showing American films and Soviet films, and it's not um, uh, by accident that it's in 1961, because that was the year of the first non-aligned conference in Belgrade. So uh, Yugoslavia, again, changed its political direction, orienting itself a little bit further away from the West, trying to reposition itself in, in this kind of no man's land in between. And again, this is reflected in the kind of films that are being showed to Yugoslav audiences. So again, you get this really strong connection between what the state wants you know, people to see and, and, and uh, to think. But uh, what I think might be interesting to you as an audience in particular is this um, link to, to Hollywood in particular. In 1948, a man called Eric Johnston came to visit Belgrade. He was then the head of the um, Motion Pictures Association of America, and he's kind of infamous in American film history because he's the man who started the blacklisting of Hollywood directors. So he was really instrumental in leading this charge against um, communist directors in American cinema, which makes his, his visit to Yugoslavia in 1948 all the more interesting. He was one of the first Western visitors to come to Yugoslavia after the break with Stalin. And he came on a mission. He actually met personally with Tito, and there is archive of this, which is absolutely fascinating to me. Um, and he was there because uh, Eric Johnston firmly believed that the strongest weapon of American influence would be American cinema. And he famously once said that, you know, if Clark Gable says he won't uh, wear a shirt anymore, young people all over the world will stop wearing shirts. So he had a very strong understanding of the power of propaganda of cinema. So, you know, in Tito, he found someone who, again, understood this uh, very well. I think it was kind, in, in some ways, a natural meeting of the minds, although I'm still very, very intrigued by the fact that Eric Johnston was so violently anti-communist afterwards. So um, his visit definitely opened the doors to Hollywood films coming to Yugoslavia, not only Hollywood films, uh, many Hollywood directors and actors, and here I've listed some that uh, you would find familiar as names. W Kirk Douglas is maybe the most interesting visit that happened in those years. He came to Yugoslavia in 1964, and his visit was sponsored by the State Department. So again, <laughs> Um, he met with Tito, and he was, in fact, Tito's favorite actor. And uh, if you've seen Cinema Comunista, you know that uh, in the end, when Tito did decide to cast himself in a film, he chose Richard Burton. The actual truth of the matter is that he chose Kirk Douglas, who wouldn't or couldn't do it, which is how Richard Burton ended up getting chosen as a second choice. Um, 
But there is a link between Kirk Douglas and Tito because uh, Kirk Douglas came back to Yugoslavia again in the 70s, which is very interesting. And oddly enough, there is a letter in Tito's personal archive from Kirk Douglas where Kirk Douglas is asking Tito for an autograph, a signed picture of himself, not vice versa. And then when he receives the, um, the signed photo of Tito, he writes again a letter to Tito saying that he's so honored that he will, he promises that he will keep this framed photograph in his office forever. I don't actually know if that's still the case. But again, some very interesting links. And I'm telling you all these things because 40% of what I found in my research ended up in Cinema Comunista, around 60% didn't. So I just think there's, there's just so many interesting details that I, I like to share that I couldn't put in the film. And I, I hopefully you'll find them interesting. But anyway, all this um, experience or con contact with American cinema definitely affected what Yugoslav filmmakers decided to make. And so let's take a quick look at what that was. Um, basically, the first Yugoslav blockbuster, uh, which is to say a film that was seen by hundreds of thousands of people and created the first film stars of Yugoslav cinema from two very young actors, uh, came out in 1962. It's a film, oddly enough, about the building of the highway between Belgrade and Zagreb, the highway of brotherhood and fraternity. It's a very symbolic thing for those of us who, um, who, who love Yugoslav cinema because uh, in a film much, much later made during the war in the 90s, which is called... Uh, I guess in English, pretty villages, pretty flames. Um, there is a scene where Yugoslav tanks head along this uh, same highway to start the war in, in Slovenia. So again, this highway is an incredibly symbolic thing for people in the former Yugoslavia. So hence this film, Prekobrojna, about a girl who decides to uh, run away from home and join her um, boyfriend, Bo, at uh, one of the youth brigades, and uh, they end up in a kind of face-off between him and her, who will be a more productive worker in the youth brigade. It's a beautiful film uh, with a singing number, which you saw yesterday in Cinema Comunista, of young people, you know, uh, carrying rocks and, and, and singing in, in Euphoria. Um, and it led to the same director made a film the year a year later, which I found absolutely fascinating. It's not a very well-known film. It's called Face to Face, or Lice Ulice. And it was incredibly inspired by the 1957 film 12 Angry Men. And in fact, it uses the same structure as 12 Angry Men. The whole film takes place in one room during one workers' meeting. By this time, they had introduced worker, worker self-management in Yugoslavia. So the whole idea was to make a film illustrating how this process works. And again, using the same model as 12 Angry Men, it starts with a situation where everyone is kind of at odds and angry with each other. And then through the reasoning of one, factory worker. They arrive at this moment of unity where they agree that the system is actually just, it's them who are corrupt, and they need to start a process of self-critiquing in order to really do the best for the factory and for their country. But there's so much ideology very cleverly placed in this film. It's not a very kind of uh, one-dimensional propaganda film. It's a very, very interesting film using a Hollywood model to sell a different type of ideology. So. Um, if you can find that film, I would I would, would warmly recommend it. I have like um, oh gosh, I don't know how to use this thing. Sorry, I have these um, screen screenshots that I took from the film that I could show you, but um, maybe later. Now, what's interesting about this is the six by sixty nine domestic films were more watched than foreign films in Yugoslavia, and this remained the trend for the next twenty years. After France, Yugoslavia was the second country in Europe where domestic films were wor more watched than American films, which again tells you something about the loyalty of the audience towards the films, but also towards their feeling that the films were really expressing something of their reality, which to me again is interesting and from an analytical perspective because that's exactly what we're looking at. Is this a reality or is this a fiction that's being presented? What I found very interesting is an interview with a, 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 a quite a radical film director called Bata Cengic, who was a Bosnian filmmaker, um, who spoke about what it was like to enter Yugoslav cinema at this time as a film director. And in one interview he gave in the early 90s, he said, and I'll, I'll, I'll just read a piece of it for you, I entered cinema as a young man who was assured that he was uh, entering a field which changes the world, as a man who accepted to be us. We were us. We were all together. You couldn't make a film about I. You couldn't make a film about an individual. You had to have a very close, uh, uh, close, a uh, very big close-up in which you had to see the happy face of a worker, his strong muscles, and uh, a man who is calm, who is content, 
who is not being entertained, but who is working and creating a very happy future. So this whole idea that uh, uh, the orientation of Yugoslav cinemas was t making films about a collective hero, a collective character rather than an individual, I think uh, helps you understand a lot of the films that were being made. It's a very useful analytical tool, I think, to look at these films. Um, and then moving on, so a lot of films were made about the youth brigades, about the worker self-management and so, but there is definitely one genre, and we touched on this last night, which dominated Yugoslav cinema. And that is, of course, what is came to be known as the partisan genre, but it's not necessarily just the partisan genre. So of the 889 fe feature fiction films shot in Yugoslavia between 47 and 1990, around 350 are films that treat this topic of the National War for Liberation. National War for Liberation is basically the official name of the partisan struggle against the Nazis during the Second World War. Um, just the statistic tells you a lot. It tells you the importance of the story of Tito's struggle and tells you how central it was to the entire Yugoslav identity and the Yugoslav narrative. And uh, I won't spend too much time on this because, again, I think it's really highlighted in Cinema Comunista what they did with these partisan films. But just to give you an idea of the genesis of the genre, the first film was made in 1946 and was made by the Russians. It wasn't made uh, by Yugoslavs, even though there were Yugoslavs in the film crew, but there were also German prisoners of war in this film crew. But it was directed by uh, Eisenstein's um, DP, which, again, gives you the close link between Yugoslav cinema and Russian and Soviet cinema. And I found this in uh, the archive of the Croatian Cinematheque, and I absolutely couldn't believe it. This is the script. This is a script which is written in two languages, uh, Russian on the left, Serbian on the right, and what I absolutely adore about the script is if you read the first line at the very top, it says, the lights go down in the cinema theater. So that's what the scripts begi script begins with. And then on the very first page, I don't think we have time for, for me to read all of this to you, but on the very first page, it shows you that the Russians have been given the task to create the narrative for Tito's fight against the Germans, and they're going to do, they're going to pack that entire narrative into one film. And really, this one film tells you every episode from the Second World War that's kind of considered relevant, even the destruction of the bridge on Neretva. You see Tito in the film which it would never have happened in a Yugoslav version of this film, but the Russians kind of did this, and, and the outcome was a film that no one was really happy with. So um, Tito kind of gave them the task to set about making the first Yugoslav partisan film, and the resulting film is something produced by the Avala Film Studios in 1947, which is a film called Slavica. Slavica was a, a huge hit in the former Yugoslavia. It was seen, again, by hundreds of thousands of people, and it is considered the kind of founding film of the genre. What I found interesting is I found a transcript of a visit of a group of film workers to Tito in 1954. And uh, Tito's asking them, what are you working on now? And are we ever going to win an Academy Award? He's always very interested in that. And um, at one point, he, they say to them, him, well, you know, we started with Slavica, we're making more of these films. And Tito says to them, um, you know, Slavica is all very and good, but you can feel the influence of propaganda in this film. It's kind of one-dimensional, which I found, again, incredibly fascinating, you know, from coming from Tito's point of view. Um, and so let's, let's just briefly touch on what is the role of Tito in partisan films. Well, the first thing that I found interesting watching these films is the changing of his image in the films. By the way, this in the background is a still of Tito on a film set during the making of a partisan film. Um, the first thing is, how much his image changes. So this is a still from uh, one, of the, one of the early films. And if you can see Tito's face on the right, it's kind of undefined. And this would be the case for at least four or five years in Yugoslav cinema. There were no official portraits of Tito yet. And so his image in Yugoslav cinema is kind of, is kind of unrecognizable. And uh, Tito himself, even though he's reading the scripts, will, no, will not give them permission to show him in the film. So he, here, for example, and I found this in his personal papers, is a copy of a script where Tito's handwriting can be seen in the margins. And so it, it's th in the script, it's a dialogue between him and uh, Captain Stewart, who is a member of the British mission sent to uh, the, the headquarters of Tito during the war. And Tito says in, in, in the margin, here you should give my answer. Um, we have launched several offensives around Yugoslavia. So he was involved in great detail in, in the making of these films. And one thing I found in his, uh, in his notes is um, viewing notes on one of the partisan films where he makes a comment that the fingernails of a partisan girl are too clean, you know, so. 
we're talking about a man who's really involved in what he's looking at. And if you've seen Cinema Comunista, you know, you know, he's a man who saw 8,801 films in 32 years. He is a bit of an expert. What I found very interesting, and, and we couldn't put it in the film because it was just too much material, but Leica's stories about how Tito watched the films. For example, because many of these films came to him from censorship, he, he didn't have time, the films weren't imported quickly enough for him to show to Tito. So oftentimes he was grabbing films that arrived in the country for the censorship board to review. They weren't subtitled. And he was showing Tito Chinese, Russian, German, English, French films without subtitles. And I, would, I asked Leica, well, how did he understand what he was watching? And Leica said, oh, he, he got what was going on. He wasn't, it wasn't so much about following. And then he said, and I said, did he ever comment on the films? And he said, you know what he would do? He, we would be watching the film, and then he'd say, Leica, stop for a minute. And he'd walk off to his office and write something down, and then he'd come back and say, okay, now we go on. And, and I began to realize what Tito's relationship to watching these films was. Well, another really interesting anecdote that I have to add, just because I'm really sorry that it didn't make it into the film. When Castro came to visit Tito in uh, Yugoslavia in 1974, he was a guest at, of Tito's Ambrioni, Tito's Island in the Adriatic. And Tito sent Leica with two films for Castro to watch. One was Neretva, the other one was Sutjeska. And um, the next night, Castro called and asked to watch them again. So Leica went and showed him the two films again. So then I said to Leica, well, what did he say after that? And Leica said, oh, he didn't say anything, but he shook my hand. And he was the third. And I said, he was the third what, Leica? And he said he was the third man who shook my hand. Sukhanuk, Sukarno, and Castro. And I just found it astonishing that in 32 years, Leica could count the number of people who shook his hand after he's shown him a film. And I just found that really, really special as an anecdote. And I'm really sorry he didn't make it into the film. But anyway, moving back to Tito and partisan films. Um, Tito would not allow them to use, his, uh, to use him as a character in a film. And here, for example, is a letter written by a film crew to him asking him for uh, the permission to introduce his character into one of the storylines. And Tito's comment on the bottom of the letter is, I will read the script and give you my opinion. You should not show my likeness. You should not show me directly. Which, again, is really interesting. But as we all know now, he changed his mind. He changed his mind, and I, uh, again, and this is in discussion with the director of the Battle of Neretva, I think what changed his mind is the international success of Neretva. Because... Um, after Neretva was shortlisted for an Academy Award and achieved this huge international recognition, then Tito gave permission to have himself uh, included in a film, which is, of course, Sutjeska. And not by accident, because Sutjeska is the film that tells the story... Oh, no, sorry, before that, and this is very important, I skipped this part. Um, there was one director who found a way to introduce Tito's likeness into the film without Tito's permission, and his name is Fadil Hadjic. He made a film in 1963 called Descent na Drvar. It is a film about a German attack that was carried out on the day of Tito's birthday, where German um, paratroopers descended uh, on this cave where Tito was hiding out in the attempt to capture him. Now, what he did is in incredibly interesting, and I'll start the clip underneath. Um, basically, you have a dialogue between three partisan officers discussing the fact that, you know, they're really... He, you know, they, they've got this kind of stronghold in the mountains and Tito's hiding in the cave and his birthday is coming up and they're preparing a uniform for his birthday. And then what the director does is he uses the first existing film image of Tito and weaves it into the story. And you'll see how he does that. So there is, this is the first recorded uh, image of Tito that exists. It was made by the English mission that was sent to Tito's headquarters. The, this original of this material is in color. It's held at the Imperial War Museum in London. What's interesting about this film is that it was produced by the Avala Film Studios. And uh, Avala Film Studios at the time was being run by Ratko Dražević, who, as you saw in Cinema Komunista, was a former officer of state security. And uh, there was a strong rivalry between the director of this film and Veiko Bulaic, who directed uh, The Battle of Neretva. So much so, in fact, that Veiko Bulaic had made an incredibly famous partisan film called Kozara, 
an incredibly expensive partisan film. And this film is a response to that film to prove that you can make a spectacular partisan film without spending too much money. So now Veiko Bulaic's response to this is to call up Tito and say they're making a film in which uh, the Germans are being shown in too favorable a light. So Ratko Dražević, the producer of this film, the head of the film studio, gets a call from Tito to bring him the rushes to see the film. And he tells this anecdote, there's a, there, there is a recorded interview where he tells the anecdote of coming to Tito's villa and the film being shown and the first reel ends and everyone's worried to see what Tito will say and, t and while they're changing to the second reel, Tito says, okay, someone bring us some beer. <laughs> and everyone breathes the sigh of relief because they see, you know, they're going to get his approval. So after this, and the driver of Ekobulaic, not having succeeded in kind of derailing this film, attempts to persuade Tito to be in Neretva, and Tito says no. And Veiko Bulaic found a very interesting solution, which you saw in Cinema Comunista yesterday. He introduces Tito's presence with this um, note that's being passed around from hand to hand, containing one of Tito's most legendary messages during the war. So now that Neretva is a success, um, and uh, Tito says, yes, you can show me in Sutjeska, because Sutjeska will tell his life story, and will tell the most dramatic moment in his life when he was wounded, and it's important to say that of all the world, of all the allied leaders in the Second World War, Tito was the only one wounded in a battlefield, which kind of really is, you know, gave him some street cred in terms of, of um, his stature as a, as a kind of a partisan fighter. What's interesting is that so the resulting film is called Sutjeska. Um, on the left, you'll see the archival footage of wounded Tito, on the right, you'll see Richard Burton portraying that role. Um, and uh, just a small kind of really juicy anecdote about this. This film was supposed to be directed by Veiko Bulaic, but it wasn't. Uh, because Veiko Bulaic, by this moment, had managed to alienate everybody else in Yugoslav cinema around him because he had this direct telephone link to Tito. That um, they spread some false rumors about him to Tito. And, and in order to really punish him, the man who was given the job to direct this film was not another celebrated director. It was, in fact, Veiko Bulaic's assistant on Neretva, a man who'd never directed a film before or after. As a result, Sutiska is really a bad movie. It's a terrible film to watch. Um, but anyway, skipping ahead to one other really fascinating anecdote about Yugoslav cinema, and I'll, I'll, I think that that's where we'll kind of leave off is um, this genre was so successful that Yugoslav filmmakers were invited to other non-aligned countries to make the partisan films for those countries. So in 1984, a group of Yugoslav filmmakers was invited to Mozambique to make the first fiction film in Mozambique that would tell the story of their struggle for resistance and their road to independence. The resulting film is a disaster called The Time of the Leopards. I had a chance to meet and talk to the man, to the um, Portuguese writer who's, who's, uh, who's actually the original scriptwriter on the film and ask him about his collaboration with the Yugoslavs and he was incredibly disappointed in this idea that you could take a model and then translate it to another country but Mozambique wasn't the only time it was done uh, they did it in Syria they did it in Egypt so uh, Yugoslav filmmakers really traveled around kind of exporting this this model of a partisan genre um, where does that leave us now uh, there were two other slides I wanted to show you but I think we'll skip them just in, in interest of time um, if we have time, we can come back to Serbian Big Brother and uh, reality TV show just to give you an idea of how now partisan films are being used in, in Serbia. But I'll skip that and, and get to what I think is really the point of, of this story. The Military Museum in Belgrade, uh, which you saw in Cinema Comunista, was to me one of the most important locations I wanted to shoot in. And the reason for that is that the Military Museum in Belgrade is the oldest museum in Serbia and tells you something about her Serbian history. Uh, the way the museum is structured is the entire ground floor is devoted to Yugoslav Serbian military history from the Middle Ages up until the Second World War. The entire second floor, so half of the building, is devoted to the story of the Second World War. The, it's a permanent exhibition that was made in 1951, opened by Tito, as you saw in Cinema Comunista. Now, this exhibition has been closed to the public since 2003. The reason it's closed to the public is that the Yugoslav, the Serbian, sorry, I keep mixing the two. The Serbian government gave the director of the museum, and it's a military-run museum, the instruction that they need to reconceptualize the exhibition because it's too biased from a communist perspective. They need to retell the story of the Second World War in a more objective way. So the director of the museum said to them, sure, no problem, we can do that. What story do you want us to tell? <laughs> Do you want us to introduce Chetnik uniforms? We can find a Chetnik uniform if you want us to. And from 2003 until today, almost 10 years, this floor remains closed to the public because the Yugoslav, the Serbian government, and the Serbian public do not have a consensus over how we want to tell the story of the Second World War. 
more disturbingly, the director of the museum said to them, and what do you want me to do about the 90s? Do you want me to create an exhibition about the war in Bosnia? Because Serbia never officially declared war with Bosnia. So how do you want me to tell this story? And I think the fact that we as a country absolutely do not have a consensus over the narrative we need to tell over the last 60 years, not to mention the last 20 years, gives you a perfect indication of you know, how we haven't succeeded in constructing our narrative, not even using cinema in Serbia today. And I think that that's where I'd like to leave it off. This is, uh, these are images of an exhibition that you won't have a chance to see. Um, it's a really beautiful exhibition. It was done by 200 of the uh, most acclaimed um, curators in the former Yugoslavia. And uh, until Serbia, there's a model of the Bridge of the Neretva, and there's me standing in front of a map of Yugoslavia, until Serbia figures out its narrative or figures out how to tell its own story, this will remain closed. And I think we also will remain completely shut off from the chance of having a successful future or a less schizophrenic country in any case. So uh, I don't know how much time I've spent talking, maybe too long, but uh, hopefully it, it's kind of added a little bit more to your understanding of what I was trying to do with Cinema Comunista. Questions?